Hey, there's a mouse hole in my wall. Hey, come quick. I'm gonna have a look. What do you see? What's in there? I'm not quite sure. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Welcome back to library class at home with Mr. S. I hope everybody's doing well. This week is Mouse Week. I'm going to read you a chapter book that stars a mouse. This was one of my favorite books when I was a kid. It's called The Mouse and the Motorcycle, and it was written by Beverly Clearly. Now, this is a chapter book, and I read you a chapter book a couple weeks ago. Remember, it, was, uh, it had a zombie in it and a kid named Hank. And remember, we talked a little bit about how the pictures are going to have to come out of your head because, well, there aren't many pictures in this book. It's not like um, the books that I read you in school where they're filled and filled with pictures. No, this is a chapter book, so it's mostly filled with words. I'm going to try to read you two chapters every day, so it'll take us about a week and a half to finish this book. And as I read it, I want you to sit back and relax and imagine what's happening in the story. You can close your eyes if it makes you able to imagine things better. Um, some of you might want to get some paper and a pencil or some crayons and draw the things that you're hearing in this book. That would be great. And if you do that, then take a picture and post it um, to my Google Classroom because I'd love to see it. Or just hang on to them and you can show me whenever we get back to school. So anyway, this is The Mouse and the Motorcycle and we are going to start right at chapter one. Chapter one is called The New Guests. <clears throat> Keith, the boy in the rumpled shorts and shirt, did not know he was being watched as he entered room 215 of the Mountain View Inn. Neither did his mother and father, who both looked hot and tired. They had come from Ohio, and for five days they had driven across the plains and deserts and over mountains to the old hotel in the California foothills, 25 miles from Highway 40. The fourth person entering room 215 may have known he was being watched, but did not care. He was Matt, 60 if he was a day, who at the moment was the bellboy. Matt also replaced worn-out light bulbs, renewed washers and leaky faucets, carried trays for people who telephoned room service to order food sent to their rooms, and sometimes prevented children from hitting one another with croquet mallets on the lawn behind the hotel. Now Matt's right shoulder sagged with the weight of one of the bags he was carrying. Here you are, Mr. Gridley, room 215 and 216, he said, setting the smaller of the bags on the luggage rack at the foot of the double bed before he opened a door in the next room. I expect you and Mrs. Gridley will want room 216. It is a corner room with twin beds and a private bath. He carried the heavy bag into the next room where he could be heard opening windows. Outside, a chipmunk chattered in a pine tree and a chickadee whistled, Phoebe Bee, Phoebe Bee. The boy's mother looked critically around the room 215 and whispered, I think we should drive back to the main highway. There must be a motel with a vacancy sign someplace. We didn't look long enough. Oh, not another mile, answered the father. I'm not driving another mile on a California highway on a holiday weekend. Did you see the way that truck almost forced us off the road? Dad, did you see those two big fellas on motorcycles? Began the boy, but stopped, realizing he should not interrupt an argument. But this place is so old, protested the boy's mother, and we only have three weeks for our whole trip. We had planned to spend the 4th of July weekend in San Francisco, and we wanted to show Keith as much of the United States as we could. Well, San Francisco will have to wait, and this is part of the United States. Besides, this used to be a very fashionable hotel, said Mr. Gridley. People came from miles around. Yeah, 50 years ago, said Mrs. Gridley, and they came by horse and buggy. The bellboy returned to room 215. The dining room opens at 6.30, sir. There is ping pong in the game room, TV in the lobby, and croquet on the back lawn. 
I'm sure you will be very comfortable. Matt, who had seen guests come and go for many years, knew there were two kinds. Those who thought the hotel was a dreadful old barn of a place, and those who thought it charming and quaint and quiet and restful. Of course we will be comfortable, said Mr. Gridley, dropping some coins into Matt's hand for carrying the bags. But this big old hotel is positively spooky, Mrs. Gridley said, making one last protest. It's probably full of mice. Matt opened the window wide. Mice? Oh, no, ma'am. The management wouldn't stand for mice. I wouldn't mind a few mice, the boy said as he looked around the room at the high ceiling, the knotty pine walls, the carpet so threadbare many of its roses had almost entirely faded. In one chair, with the animasser on its back, the wash basin and towel racks in the corner of the room, I like it here, he said, a whole room to myself. Usually I get a cot in the corner of a motel room. His mother smiled, relenting. Then she turned to Matt. I'm sorry, it's just that it was so hot crossing Nevada, and we're not used to mountain driving. Back on the highway, the traffic was bumper to bumper. I'm sure we'll be very comfortable here. After Matt had gone, closing the door behind him, Mr. Gridley said, I need a rest before dinner. 400 miles of driving, and then that mountain traffic. It was too much. If we're going to stay for the weekend, I'd better unpack, said Mrs. Gridley. At least I'll have a chance to do some drip drying. Alone in room 215 and unaware that he was being watched, the boy began to explore. He got down on his hands and knees and looked under the bed. He leaned out the open window as far as he could and greedily inhaled deep breaths of pine-scented air. He turned the hot and cold water on and off in the wash basin and slipped one of the small bars of paper-wrapped soap into his pocket. Under the window, he discovered a knot hole in the pine wall down by the floor and squatting, poked his finger into the hole. When he felt nothing inside, he lost interest. Next, Keith opened his suitcase and took out an apple and several small cars, a sedan, a sports car, and an ambulance about six inches long, and a red motorcycle, half the length of the cars, which he dropped on the striped bedspread before he bit into the apple. He ate the apple noisily in big chomping bites, and then laid the core of, on the bedside table between the lamp and the telephone. Keith began to play, running his cars up and down the bedspread, pretending that the stripes on the spread were highways, and making noises with his mouth, like vroom vroom for the sports car, and for the ambulance, and for the motorcycle, up and down the stripes. Once Keith stopped suddenly and looked quickly around the room as if he expected to see something or someone. But when he saw nothing, he returned to his cars. Vroom, vroom, bang, crash. The sports car hit the sedan and rolled off the highway stripe. The motorcycle came roaring to the scene of the crash. Keith, his mother called from the next room. Time to get washed up for dinner. Oh, okay. Keith parked his cars in a straight line on the bedside table right beside the telephone where they looked like a row of real cars, only much, much smaller. The first thing Mrs. Gridley noticed when she and Mr. Gridley came into the room was the apple core on the table. She dropped it with a thunk into the metal wastebasket beside the table, and she gave several quick little sniffs of the air and said, looking perplexed, mm, I don't care what that bellboy said. I'm sure this hotel has mice. <gasps> Ooh, I sure hope so, muttered Keith. And that, boys and girls, is the end of chapter one.